Good morning. I am Reverend Angela Williams, Associate Minister of Missional Engagement. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to divide your word. I ask that you will stand me behind your cross. Let no one see me but see you. Let no one hear me but hear you. It is my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a new year. Tomorrow begins a brand new year. It's something wonderful about the possibility of beginning a new of having a fresh start that allows us to hope for better, a better job, a better career, better finances, a better weight when we step on the scale. Just a better future in general, whether that be for ourselves or for our loved ones. And for each one of us, We'll close out this last day of the year in our own way to bring in the new year. Some of us will celebrate big like the happenings in New York's Times Square. Some of us may have a solemn time of prayer and remembrance of the old year's accomplishments and failures and the anticipation of the new year's promises and hopes. And many of us will do something in between these two, and some of us will realize that sleep is more important and we will head to bed at 8.30. Amen. But as I was studying for the sermon, I ran across a statement written on December 31st, New Year's Eve, 1862. It was written by abolitionist, orator, writer, statesman Frederick Douglass. And he was speaking about that particular New Year's Eve, and it reads, it is a day for poetry and song, a new song. These cloudless skies, this balmy air, this brilliant sunshine are in harmony with the glorious morning of liberty about to dawn upon us. What Douglas was writing about became known as Watch Night or Freedom's Eve, when enslaved and free African Americans on the night of December 31st, 1862, practiced their faith under the secret and protective cover of trees and brush, praying and singing and praising God as they watched and waited for the news of freedom that would come at the stroke of midnight, the start of a brand new year. For, for over 400 years, their African ancestors had been kidnapped or bound and locked in chains. Whole families, even villages, disappeared. Families were separated, never to see each other again. Shackled and packed in the holes of ships and taken to different parts of the world, mostly the Americas, where they were sold into slavery. These people had lived lives of hardship, suffering, and abuse. They were deprived of all dignity and every human right. But now, as Douglas had stated, the morning of liberty was about to dawn on them. And on January 1st, 1863, it did. As the long-awaited Emancipation Proclamation went into effect and American slaves were legally free. Slavery and its continuing aftermath of racism, nativism, xenophobia, and general intolerance have left many of God's people reeling. It's a horrible stain on the fabric of America. And we as a side to seem not to know what to do with any of it. Do we try to get rid of the stain or do we pretend it's not there? Because stains are so deeply ingrained and difficult to wash out a lot of times they are ignored. However, my suggestion this morning is that like those who look toward a brighter day regarding their circumstances on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1862, we watch. And I propose to you today that they watched for a new day instead of waited 
for a new day. Because watching involves seeing what can be different. Watching involves perceiving and con contemplating the changes that should happen. Watching involves a vision, the ability to think about and plan the future with imagination and wisdom. So my friends, we too must watch. And our scripture today will guide us to watch as we follow Simeon as an example. If you will stand now in body or in spirit for the reading of our scripture found on page 59 of your pew Bibles, we'll be reading second chapter of Luke 22, and then we'll go to 25 to 32. And God's word reads, <clears throat> When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The scripture in Luke is often referred to as the presentation in the temple where Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, bring him to the temple in Jerusalem for ritual purposes according to the law of Moses. This section of the gospel does two things. One, it affirms Jesus' physically and socially significant humanity. And two, it places Jesus solidly in a specific political and religious world, a world powered by the distant imperial city of Rome, a world in which God's chosen people, the Israelites, believed that being the chosen people meant that they would become masters of the world and lords of the nation. In order for that to happen, they awaited another king. They awaited King David. Some believed even that God, God's self, would break directly into history by supernatural means, and he did. However, not like they wanted. But in contrast to all of those, uh, there were those in the land who dreamed of no violence, no power, or armies. These quiet in the land, as they were called, believed in a life of constant prayer and quiet watchfulness until God should come. This was the like of Simeon, who had lived a long life of devotion to God, the creator. He followed the ordinances of God to the letter as devout and righteous man, with the hand of the Holy Spirit, God the sustainer, resting on him. However, his people were still reeling in the aftermath of being taken into captivity in Babylon. And even more recently, their temple, their house of worship, had been destroyed. Seeing his people suffer day after day, he watched quietly and patiently prayed and worshiped in faithful expectation for the day when God, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, would come as consolation and comfort for his people. And why would he do this? Why might Simeon continue this vigil year after year, even when it seemed as if there would be no change? It could be that Simeon decided early in his life that he would live out who God called him to be. He allowed himself to always be guided by the Holy Spirit. He was taught by the word of God and he was obedient to the will of God. 
Additionally, Simeon has listed character traits of being righteous and devout. So let's slow down a bit here. The word righteous in Latin is justitia, which means just and justice. Just is defined as behaving according to what is morally right and fair. But as Christians, we must search the, the scriptures and not a dictionary to define our requirement to act justly. Micah 6, 8 reads, the Lord God has told us what is right and what he demands. See that justice is done. Let mercy be your first concern and humbly obey your God. In Micah 6, 8, the Hebrew word for just is misfat. Misfat equals justice. Justice equals equality. So misfat's most basic meaning, justice's most basic meaning, righteousness's most basic meaning is to treat people equitably, assuring their rights and giving them what they are due, whether that's punishment, protection, or care. Simeon was also devout. The Hebrew word for devout is hesed, which in one word wraps up in itself all the positive attributes of God, love, covenant, mercy, grace, kindness, loyalty, in short, acts of loving kindness and mercy that go well beyond the call of duty. So Simeon understood what it meant to advocate for those who needed justice and love. He understood God's command to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Simeon wasn't just looking out for himself. He could look around and see the state of his community, had love and compassion for the situation, and made it his business to continue to watch for consolation, comfort, peace, equality, injustice. Simeon knew a change had to come. And I don't know about you, but when I grow up, I want to be like Simeon when it comes to advocating for the needs of the people around me. Not everybody has it as good as I do. So as I move into this new year, a new day of dawning, I'm going to watch for consolation for my community, my country, and my world. When the playing field is uneven and there are evident economic, social, and educational disadvantages, I'm going to pray and watch for cons consolation. When I see overly aggressive of policing in poor and minority communities, I'm going to pray and watch for consolation. And when I see women of color consistently receive inadequate maternal health care, I'm going to pray and watch for consolation. Simeon watched for consolation, positive change for Israel. And as a proponent for justice and love, he prayed for something different that the world could change and the dire situation of his people would change. And we can do as Simeon did as well, because we too are righteous. According to 2 Corinthians 5.21, we are the righteousness of God. It is God's righteousness through our faith in Jesus Christ that makes us as believers righteous. We are therefore righteous and can advocate for just practices by the virtue of Jesus' righteousness. And as righteous and just people of God, moving toward the dawn of a brand new day, a brand new year, I challenge us to watch like Simeon for the comfort of God's people, for the good of God's people. In 1969, Lorraine Hale brought home <clears throat> a mother and child who were addicted to drugs. It was then that her mother, Clara McBride Hale, founded Hale House in Harlem. 
Miss Hale originally opened her house as a daycare to make a living, but eventually she began taking in children who were born addicted to crack, heroin, and other drugs because of their mother's addiction. And she and her children worked tirelessly to heal these addicted children and their parents, keeping the frailest of them in her room at night, cradling them and walking the floors all night when necessary to comfort them through the pain of detoxification. This lovely Baptist woman once said about her tireless work, when I get to heaven, I'm going to rest. But she knew that for the moment, she had the much more important task of comforting her people. Mother Hill, as she was known, spent 52 years helping over a thousand drug addicted babies, young children, and mothers. Guided by the Holy Spirit, Simeon entered the temple just at the right moment. At that point, he had prayed for so long, he only wanted one thing before he left this earth. And it wasn't that his reputation be esteemed. It wasn't that his name be honored or for his family to be financially secure. The only thing that this righteous and devout man wanted was to one time look upon the face that had the light of God on it, that would initiate the unfolding of God's promise for his people. So he took Jesus in his arms and discerned through the Holy Spirit that his prayers would be answered. And this was the beginning of salvation for his people. Can you imagine holding Jesus in all that he represents in your arms? Simeon watched for consolation for his people and it has come in the form of a child who is God, Theos, Lord, Curios. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is Messiah, the anointed one. He is Jehovah, the sacred one. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, Simeon is holding in his arms the savior of the world, the one who has all power in his hands, the one to whom no thing is impossible, the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he, this child, is Lord. And at that point, Simeon could only do one thing, and that was to praise God. When righteous people, when devout people hold Jesus, consolation is possible. Hope, peace, and restoration are possible. But notice that Simeon took Jesus in his arms. Jesus wasn't placed. Jesus wasn't forced on Simeon. What Simeon did was an act of acceptance. He accepted the grace found in Jesus Christ. And we too, as Christians who have accepted Jesus, hold Jesus in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls and in our spirits. And we may never do the work of Mother Hale, but we are powerful, righteous, and devout people of God who hold Jesus, the light of the world, who can shine his light in this dark world. We hold Jesus, the bread of life, who can feed spiritual food to those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We hold Jesus, the vine, and anybody connected to him will see power to do the work he's calling to do. Good people, we hold Jesus, the resurrection, and the life. All who abide in him will have the comfort of knowing that eternal life begins now and will be forevermore. So as we watch for the dawning of a new day, 
in our lives and in the world. Let us continue to hold Jesus, the salvation of the world, because he has everything we need. But what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. When Bert Bacharach offered Dionne Warwick the song, What the World Needs Now, she initially turned it down, saying that it was too country and too preachy. Well, as a preacher, I like it because it's preachy and to the point. What the world needs is love, sweet love. And it's not enough, and it can't be just for some. It has to be for everyone. Simeon prayed for the consolation of his people and God had responded by sending love in the form of a baby named Jesus, whose name, by the way, comes from the root meaning salvation. But it didn't take long for Simeon to realize that the salvation, the deliverance, the restoration, the rescuing through Jesus had not come just for his people Israel, but that it had come for everyone. And he exclaims, my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for glory for your people, Israel. Therefore, salvation from the very start was meant to include everyone. And the term gospel or good news is the essence of salvation. All of the gospels record various accounts of Jesus rescuing, saving, delivering people from physical, spiritual, and psychological bondage and restoring them to wholeness and soundness. And as disciples of Christ, we are called to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we go to everyone. We are to watch for ways to live connected to those who hurt, to those who are in need, to those who have been pushed to the margins of society. We are to watch for ways to live outwardly, seeing all of God's people, being present in ways that bring relief and hope to everyone. Because Jesus' love has broken down dividing walls that separate people and communities by class, by race, economic status, gender, ethnicity, etc., etc. Jesus has broken down those walls. Therefore, as the righteous and devout body of Christ that we are here at First Church, as we move into this new year, we can watch for ways to seek peace for all who need it. Because Jesus, our salvation, is our peace and calls us to be a community of peace. We can watch for ways to seek justice for all because Jesus, our salvation, is our justice and calls us to do it. We can watch for ways to seek freedom for all because Jesus, our salvation, has set us free and calls for everyone to live in this freedom. And we are blessed to serve at a church where we understand that salvation and restoration and consolation belong to all of God's children. First church, we reach beyond the four walls of this church. We're dedicated to watching for ways to include those who need to be consoled, those who need to be cared for. For example, our, our justice builders have been watching to find ways to educate our community about and advocate for housing disparities based on race. They're watching to assure fair voting will happen and will host Dallas fake votes in February. Be on the watch for it. Our Racial justice cohort has been watching for ways to address the writing on the wall above our raw steps. In February, they will host an event titled does the scarlet letter S define us? 
First United Methodist Church and the problematic legacy of the Methodist Episcopal South. Dr. Ted Campbell will be here to educate us all. Be on the watch for it. Our one plus one Dallas Church to School partnership with DISD is on the watch and will host the National African American Family Involvement Day for three schools this year in February. Be on the watch for it. Our Mental Wellness Interfaith Alliance Task Force is on the watch to team up with St. Paul's Body and Soul's Homeless Ministry to support the Journey Partner program to help our unsheltered guests and neighbors find housing and all the other necessities that they need in life. Be on the watch for it. And our United Women in Faith, well, what aren't they on the watch for? <laughs> but they will be watching to eradicate racial disparities in maternal and infant health and are partnering with Texas Impact for a legislative event to happen in Austin next month. Be on the watch for it. First Church, we are definitely on the watch. And these are just some of the ways that our body of Christ is spreading the love of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone. God's word says that God so loved the world not parts of it, not bits of it, but the whole inclusive world that God gave God's only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. And my friends, because everlasting life begins the moment we accept God's grace of salvation, we need to be on the watch for those who need us as we live on this earth now. Watch Night is about praising God for bringing us from one year to the next and then watching to see Jesus' salvation and consolation and change for the better, for the concerns that need to be addressed in the year that stretches out in front of us. It's about praying like Simeon with enough power to loose heaven on earth. And as we enter this year, it's my prayer that we all channel our inner Simeon, watching and looking for ways to live fully engaged, not turning away from brokenness or difficulty or from suffering or need, but that we watch and be ready to meet those in need where they are, no matter who they are, because we are righteous and devout. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.